Democracies in the 1920s, the interwar years. Key concept. The Weimar Republic was set up at the end of World War I by the Social Democratic Party, or SPD, in Germany. They took control of the government on November 9, 1918, two days before the armistice was signed. Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated his throne and the SPD had been the largest party in Germany prior to the war, if you recall, from previous units. Fear of communist revolutions throughout the country prompted Philip Schneidemann to proclaim a republic, but without official consent from any other parties, and this will cause trouble in the inner war years. So let's talk about, first of all, the troubles that the Weimar Republic will have with threats from the left, meaning the left wing on the political spectrum. Spartacists were a group of communists led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. They took control of Berlin, the city of Berlin, which is the capital city, for a week in January 1919. Elements of the Freikorps, Corps, however, crushed the communist uprising, killing its leader. The Freikorps Corps will eventually be kind of the basis for which the SS will be uh, created by Hitler uh, in the coming year. Freikorps or Free Corps are right-wing volunteer paramilitary groups that formed after the war, mostly by former soldiers who returned home from the war to no job. They became the vanguard of anti-communist repression, and they will be uh, very attracted to the Nazi platform. Germany's lack of experience with democracy made the Weimar Republic's hold on power very tenuous, meaning very dicey. The Weimar Republic had to rely on conservative military groups to save it from communist outbreaks throughout the country multiple times. This damaged the Republic's prestige in the minds of the people. The military supported the government, provided it maintain army discipline and root out Bolshevism, meaning anything that resembled the Bolsheviks from Russia, meaning communists. In effect, the government became a prisoner of the German army after the war, and thus their power was not seen as being very strong by the general public. Elections in January 1919 created a center-left coalition in charge of running the government. This is largely because Germany had a multi-party system, so it was difficult for any one party to ever get a real majority. They had to have coalition governments instead. The SPD had the most seats in the Reichstag, but not a true majority, which is 50% plus one. So they also shared power with the Center Party and the German Democratic Party as a result. The capital was moved to Weimar, Germany to distance the government from the Prussian imperial traditions of Berlin, the city that had been the capital of Prussia initially, and of course of the German Empire once it was formed in 1871. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the Treaty of Versailles and its impact on Germany in the interwar years. To the Germans of all parties, whether they are left wing, right wing, or center, the treaty represented a harsh, dictated peace to be revised or repudiated as soon as possible. Article 231, if you recall, placed sole blame for the war on Germany and the terms of the peace were very harsh as a result. Remember that Article 231 is what we refer to as the War Guilt Clause. Germany was required to pay enormous reparations to France and Britain, upwards of $39 billion. Germany's military strength was severely weakened. Uh, they were demilitarized. Germany lost Alsace and Lorraine to France. Germany lost Eastern territory to Poland, that Polish corridor that we talked about before. 
East Prussia was separated from the rest of Germany by that Polish corridor that extended the north to the Baltic Sea, isolating those Germans that lived in the East Pr Prussia territory. French troops would occupy the Rhineland to ensure against German aggression as well. So the Germans felt as if they had an enmity of hate all around them at all times. These territories were supposed to be permanently demilitarized, but the French side ultimately was not fully demilitarized. And here's a map. So you can see the territories that were lost to Weimar Germany um, and, and were ceded to other ter territories. France took economic control of the Saar border region, which was rich in coal and iron mines as well. The region would be administered for 15 years by the League of Nations as a result of this. So just to review what we said before in an earlier unit, Germany lost control of its economic destiny with the territories that were taken from them. They uh, had a very difficult time being able to raise funds because these industrially rich territories were taken from them. Yet they were also being charged these very heavy reparation payments. It just didn't make sense. How in the world could they be expected to pay if they had their ability to make money taken away from them? And thus lies the problem with the Treaty of Versailles. After 15 years, the people of the Saar region would also be able to vote on whether they wanted to remain part of Germany or become part of France. France, above all, was eager to ensure its future security against German aggression, although it sought to punish Germany for starting the war. While Britain also sought to punish Germany, many Brits believed a healthy German economy was essential to a healthy British economy as trade partners. John Maynard Keynes, a British economist, wrote a book called Economic Consequences of the Peace and published it that same year, 1919. In this book, as an economist, he looked at the Versailles Treaty and he saw how impossible it was, not just for Germany, but he was very concerned over the impact it may have on all of Europe. He criticized the Versailles Treaty, declaring its punishing of Germany would damage the European economy as a whole. And ultimately, he is the one who argued that by taking the territories away from Germany, which would allow them to uh, control their own economic destiny, and then charging them the heavy reparation payments, that the rest of Europe had forced Germany into a position of servitude. He also warned that this would ultimately bring bad things to bear in the future. He warned that it would do nothing but create resentment among the German people towards the rest of the Western nations in Europe. And he was right. The Weimar government in June of 1919 signed the Versailles Treaty, probably dooming that Weimar Republic from the very start. Conservatives, including the influential military elements, saw the signing of the treaty as a, quote, stab in the back, or a diktat, the dictated peace. A new constitution was created in August of 1919 for the Weimar Republic. The Reichsrat was the upper chamber that represented the federal states and the Reichstag was the lower house that was elected by universal suffrage. And it supplied the chancellor and the cabinet. The chancellor, remember, is kind of like the German version of a prime minister. And the cabinet is like, you know, our own presidential cabinet. The president of the Weimar Republic would be elected for a seven year term. Female suffrage was also granted by this new constitution in Germany. Now, there will be also threats from the right, just like we saw there were threats from the left from the get-go. The Cap Putsch in 1920 is evidence of this. The Cap Putsch is basically a rebellion, Putsch meaning rebellion or riot. Conservative politicians and businessmen 
with help from disgruntled army officers who returned home from the war with nothing to show for it, defeated, took control of Berlin in March of 1920 and declared a new government. Conservative parties gave their support to this as well. At the same time, right-wing conservatives took control of Bavaria as well. So it looks as if the right-wing takeover is going to happen right off the bat. Chancellor Friedrich Ebert implored workers throughout Germany to defend the Weimar Republic from a right-wing takeover. A general strike actually will help. It resulted in um, it resulted, which brought the country's economic activities to a halt. The putsch collapsed as a result, and the republic was saved. When businesses shut down, those conservative businessmen who had originally supported the right wing takeover uh, pull away their support from it because they need to get their workers back in the factories. Remember, Germany is bad off economically. So if business comes to a complete halt, it's going to be even worse. Though certain conservative groups failed to take power at this time, they continued to gain seats through elections in the Reichstag as time goes by. The SPD eventually withdrew from the government, leaving a fragile center and right-wing coalition in charge of the Weimar Republic. Keep now in 1923, we have the Ruhr crisis happening with the Weimar Republic. Those reparation payments had been very difficult for Germany to pay. The Allies announced in 1921 that Germany had to pay 33 billion in reparations. It will eventually be 39 billion with um, with interest. Uh, Germany's economy was still weak, and it could not pay all of the reparations, especially all at once. In 1923, France, led by Raymond Poincaré, a occupy the industrial rural region of Germany, basically saying if you cannot pay the reparation payments, we're going to seize more territory from you, Germany. The Weimar government ordered the rural residents to stop working and passively resist French occupation in the region. Here is the region right here. This is a German poster urging passive resistance during the Ruhr crisis under the motto, No, you will not subdue me. Runaway inflation occurred when Germany printed money to try to pay the reparations. If you just print money without any uh, gold or silver or something valuable to back up that currency, what it does is devalue the currency overall. The value of the German mark went from approximately nine marks per German, sorry, per U.S. dollar in 1919 to 4.2 trillion marks per dollar by mid-November of 1923. I want you to take a look at those numbers again, folks. Nine marks per one U.S. dollar in 1919 to 4.2 trillion German marks per U.S. dollar by mid-November 1923. That is what we call massive inflation. As you see in this picture, some Germans resorted to carrying highly deflated currency in wheelbarrows to buy such modest items as a loaf of bread. The currency was so devalued that it wasn't even worth the paper it was printed on. Some people will even use it as uh, when they don't have firewood to burn for warmth or to wallpaper their walls uh, to try to uh, cover up cracks in the walls uh, that are letting cold in. Here is a chart that you can take a look at later showing you how the inflation happened and how rapidly it happened.
This is a hundred million uh, mark note. November 3rd, 1923. And it would buy about three pounds of meat. This brought about a social revolution in Germany. The accumulated savings of many retired and middle class people were completely wiped out by the devaluation of the currency. If you have X amount of German marks in the bank saved up for your retirement and all of a sudden the inflation makes those marks value less, then of course you are wiped out and there's nothing that you can do about it. This is going to cause a social revolution in Germany, a crisis. The middle class resented the government and blamed Western governments, big business, workers, Jews, and communists for the nation's woes. Scapegoats all. Many later supported Hitler as a result because Hitler made promises to fix the economy and to pull Germany out of its economic depression. And ultimately, he delivered on that promise, and therefore, he gained a lot of supporters. Now, let's talk a little bit about the rise of the Nazi Party and Adolf Hitler himself. More of this will be covered in the later lecture as well uh, in this same unit. The Beer Hall Putsch, first of all. Putsch, remember, means rebellion or revolt. Uh, in an attempted revolution, Adolf Hitler who had been a, uh, a member of the German army, low rank in the German army, I don't think he ever rose past corporal um, during World War I. He and the Nazi party, he joined this Nazi party when returning home from the war to no job. Many other disenchanted soldiers also joined the Nazi party, uh, which I said before was kind of an offshoot of that Fry Corps that had been um, formed. Um, they were very disgruntled, they were very angry at the government for uh, not supporting them in the war, and of course now it's a different government than it had been during the war, but they didn't care about that. Um, they also uh, saw the Weimar Republic as signing, they're the ones responsible for signing the peace treaty that was so punitive towards Germany, which ultimately made them not have a livelihood since they had no jobs to come home to. So again, they resented the Weimar Republic because of that as well. Anyhow, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party uh, attempted another revolution um, with the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich. Um, it actually was in the state of Bavaria uh, and it failed, however. Um, Hitler was sentenced to one year in jail um, as the, one of the leaders of this putsch. Uh, and it will be here where he writes his famous autobiography and blueprint for his rise to totalitarian power, Mein Kampf, meaning my struggle. Hitler's light jail term reflected conservative judges who sympathized with the anti-Republican views. Hitler and Nazi popularity coincided with Weimar problems throughout the 1920s and 19, early 1930s. Here are early Nazis who participated in the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, while serving his jail sentence for his role in the Beer Hall Putsch. Gustav Stressman assumed leadership of the Weimar Republic in 1923. Stressman called off passive resistance in the Ruhr region and agreed to pay reparations to France, but also sought consideration of Germany's ability to pay, meaning could they make payments on a time schedule instead of having to pay everything all at once. Uh, Poincaré, uh, head of the French government at the time, agreed to um, uh, uh, reducing the um, payments to being done all at once, to being done on a payment plan. Streisman was supported by the Social Democrats in Germany, and if you remember, they were more, I guess, mm, centrists 
than the SPD, but not as right wing as, say, the Nazis or other conservative groups. Uh, Stressman restored Germany to normal status in the European community with the Locarno Pact signed in 1925 that guaranteed Germany's borders with France and Belgium would be, uh, would stay the same. Key concept. The Dawes Plan of 1924 was initiated uh, where the League of Nations um, uh, would restructure Germany's debt with U.S. loans to Germany to back to, to pay back Britain and France who likewise paid back the U.S. Now this may sound a little strange and I'll explain this a little bit more um, because the U.S. was not a member of the League of Nations. However, if you remember from any of the previous American history you had, America's economy was pretty strong during the 1920s. We actually were going through what was called the Roaring Twenties. Um, and uh, because our market was doing so well at the time, a lot of those European nations um, wanted to invest in our stock market to help recoup some of the losses, the economic losses that they had suffered during World War I. So the Dawes plan, like I said, was in order to restructure Germany's debt. Basically, the United States would loan Germany money. Germany would then be able to pay their debts back to Great Britain and France. And then Britain and France would be able to pay their debts back to the US. It resulted in German economic recovery at least for a couple of years. The Young Plan in 1929 was supposed to be a continuation of the Dawes Plan, but it became moot or non-existent when the Great Depression hit. Here's how it's supposed to work. The international financial system under the Dawes Plan and then the Young Plan, okay? Um, the U.S. would lend two and a half billion dollars in loans to Germany. Germany would then pay two billion dollars in reparation payments to the other allies, namely France and Great Britain. And then those allies, France and Great Britain, could pay 2.6 billion in war debt payments back to the U.S. Of course, interest will have to be earned on all of these things in order for this to work. Like I say, it will work for a short period of time but ultimately will fall apart when the Great Depression hits in the United States. Now let's talk a little bit about what was going on in France. There were economic problems for France as well after the war. Even though they were on the winning side of the war, remember their uh, economy was completely torn up. Um, uh, fighting wars are expensive and especially when the war was fought at least the western front of the war was fought primarily on French soil, it would be very, very costly for France. Its challenges were similar to those in Germany. Death, devastation, and debt of World War I created economic chaos and political unrest in France. Throughout the 1920s, the government's multi-party system was dominated by parties on the right or conservatives. It supported the status quo and had the backing of business, army, and the church. And that's why they took such a hard line against Germany and wanted to punish Germany so much. In 1926, Raymond Poincaré was recalled to office. His government slashed spending and raised taxes, restoring confidence in the economy, ultimately. Key concept. Now let's talk about Great Britain. War the wartime trend toward greater social equality continued in Great Britain, helping maintain some social harmony there. The Representation of the People's Act of 1928, if you recall from a previous lecture, gave women over 21 the right to vote. The Representation of the People's Act of 1918 had given women over 30 the right to vote, if you recall. Yet, the concentration of wealth in Britain was more geared towards the top than any other European country. The top 1% owned two-thirds of the national wealth. 
Unemployment was Britain's biggest problem in the 1920s. They had about 12% unemployment. Um, and a lot of it is be this is because of the war. Britain had not recovered from economic losses suffered during World War I. In 1926, a general strike happened where most all of the factory workers throughout Britain went on strike. The support for the miners, it started with the miners striking, but eventually all, most all of the factory workers throughout Britain joined with the miners, the coal miners, in striking. Um, and this stopped business almost completely. So the support for miners who feared a dramatic drop in their already low wages swept the country. The strike eventually failed. The government outlawed such sympathetic labor strikes in 1927 as a result. If you see here, it's another uh, political cartoon showing a constitutional government um, and where the, the lever breaks. It's general strike um, is what's written on the lever there. Um, ultimately, the lever breaks, general strike is broken, and the constitutional government remains. But of course, not a lot has done, been done to fix the economic crisis and the unions, the people pulling on the general strike uh, lever there, are left not really with any victory at all. Growth of social welfare in Great Britain, however, did happen. After World War I, the government was forced to provide unemployment benefits of equal size to the unemployed which also included subsidized housing, about 200,000 units were built, kind of like um, uh, uh, projects, like the projects, um, you know, HUD housing like we have in the United States, similar kind of situation. Uh, they were also providing medical aid and increased old age pensions. This is why they had to raise taxes in order to pay for them. And the wealthy were not happy about this. The Labor Party, however, will rose as a champion of the working classes during this time period. Uh, they also were seen as supporters of greater social equality, and they took power briefly in the British Parliament in 1924. They were led by Ramsay MacDonald. The Labor Party came to replace the Liberal Party as the main opposition to the Conservatives in the British Parliament. The Liberal Party's tradition, traditional 19th century support of free trade no longer seemed relevant after this war had been fought. The Conservatives regained power by framing the Labor Party, however, as pro-communist when it officially recognized the Soviet Union as, you know, a communist nation. So because most everybody was more afraid of communism than they were, uh, were of conservatism. This is how conservative um, governments uh, gained control throughout Europe. Now the conservatives in England were under Stanley Baldwin and he ruled Britain as the prime minister between 1924 and 1929. It showed the same compromising spirit, however, on social issues like female suffrage was um, um, still guaranteed. Uh, this conservative government did expand pensions to widows, orphans, and the elderly as well. So they did not reverse all social reforms. They just did not want uh, a communist takeover. And many were concerned that the la if the Labor Party continued to be in charge of parliament, that that was where England was headed. Everybody had seen what had happened in um, in, the, in Soviet Russia, and um, most folks were more fearful of communism at this point than of the right wing. Key concept. Now let's talk a little bit about the Irish question, which was still around, um, plaguing the British Parliament at, after World War I was over. After the Easter Rebellion of 1916, the extremist group called Sinn Féin it was a faction, uh, gained prominence in Ireland. This will prompt a civil war between the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, and the Black and Tan, England's special occupation forces there. Uh, 
the Sinn Féin faction was part of the larger Irish Republican army. They were the extremist group. Um, ultimately, the Black and Tan were England's special occupation forces fight against the IRA. In October 1921, London created the Irish Free State, meaning the Parliament created the Irish Free State, from which Ulster withdrew as part of the British Commonwealth. So Northern Ireland will remain firmly in the hands of Great Britain and part of the United Kingdom, but the southern part of Ireland will be I the Irish Free State. In 1922, Britain granted Southern Catholic Ireland full autonomy after failing to suppress a bitter guerrilla war. Now we also see a little bit of the loosening of the empire as well. Not full letting go of the empire, but loosening of some of their hold on some of their imperial territories. The end of its protectorate in Egypt happened, except for the Suez Canal after World War I. So England will not control Egypt, but they will still control the Suez Canal. They did allow for equality of British dominions of Canada and Australia as well. Key concept. Now let's talk about the impact of the Great Depression. What you need to recognize in terms of this European history course is even though the Great Depression happened in America, because of the Dawes plan and all of those American dollars invested in Europe to help restore the economies of Europe and those Europeans investing, you know, trying to gain money um, um, from America through their stock market adventures, um, we will see it will have a worldwide impact. So causes, World War I debt, nationalistic tariff policies, meaning the United States, and overproduction, depreciated currencies, disrupted trade policies and speculation created weaknesses in the economies worldwide. Overproduction of agriculture in Europe drove food prices down, thus hurting the farmers. In 1930, the U.S. instituted extremely high Holly Smoot tariff which resulted in retaliation by 23 other countries. Now we did this because the crash had happened the previous October, October of 1929. And we were trying to get some of that money back from Europe that we had lent them during the 1920s with the Dawes plan. Ultimately, because those other countries could not really afford to pay it, uh, they will try to retaliate against the Holly Smoot tariff. In 1931, Britain went off the gold standard to try to recover their economy. 20 other countries followed suit. Ultimately, this um, was a, only a temporary fix because what it ends up doing is devaluing the currencies in those nations. Key concept. Now, the stock market crash that I mentioned a moment ago of 1929 perhaps triggered the U.S. Depression that eventually spread worldwide, and it signaled the beginning of a worldwide economic catastrophe. Dependence on post-World War I American investment capital, remember the Dawes plan, led to financial collapse all throughout the world when the U.S. cut off capital flows to Europe due to the depression. The stock market crash signaled the beginning of that Holly Smoot tariff and eventually the capital from the U.S. will stop flowing into Europe causing an economic crisis throughout the world. New York bankers began recalling loans that they had made to Germany and other European countries, thus exacerbating Europe's economic crisis, making it even worse. Long-term problems within the U.S. economy leading to the Depression are as follows. There was weak international economy, as we've discussed, because of the 
costs of World War I. Overproduction of goods in the United States also forced prices down. Unstable banking practices in the United States was also a problem. Certain weak industries and half of all Americans lived below the poverty line as a result of all of this. Half, folks. Now, the impact that the Great Depression has on Europe is staggering. It shattered the fragile optimism of the political leaders in the late 1920s. The decline of production occurred in every country except Russia with its command economy under communism. We'll talk more specifically about that command economy in Soviet Russia in another lecture. Mass unemployment resulted throughout Europe. Germany was hit hardest with 43% unemployment. Great Britain had 18% unemployment. The United States during the Depression had 25% unemployment. So think about that, folks. Think about how hard this hit Germany. It was awful here in the United States, but it was almost, you know, 18% worse, more people were out of work in Germany. The, the results, of course, would be staggering for Germany. Key concept. Attempted remedies that were, were put into place, of course, in the United States, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in the U.S. sought to reform capitalism with increased government intervention in the economy, more socialism. It influenced certain European countries as well. A Keynesian approach developed by John Maynard Keynes, who we mentioned before, was used after 1938 to permanently prop up the economy through public works programs and subsidies. That's exactly what the New Deal was. The New Deal was a Keynesian approach to economics. The government props up the economy through public works programs and subsidies to try to kickstart the economy. But this means that the government has a larger role in the everyday lives of all people. Bigger government rather than smaller government, which is, after all, more socialism. Scandinavia's response to depression was most successful under its socialist government. There was some British recovery that will happen, although it takes time. Orthodox economic theory followed after 1929. Britain abandoned the gold standard, reorganized industry, increased tariffs or taxes for uh, goods that they were exporting. They reformed their finances cut government spending and eventually balance the budget. Although the unemployed workers received barely enough welfare to live on anymore. The economy, however, does recover in Great Britain considerably after 1932 at the expense of those workers who were not receiving those benefits any longer. The years after 1932 were actually better for Great Britain than those in the in the 1920s. Like the US, Britain came out of depression permanently due to the rearmament for World War II. We'll discuss more of that in a later lecture as well. World War II is what pulled the US and Great Britain out of their depressions. What about France? The impact of the depression didn't occur immediately in France as it wasn't as highly industrialized as Britain, Germany, and the U.S. The Depression increased, however, class tensions over time in France and gave birth to a radical right-wing groups that supported government reorganization along fascist lines. Yes, this is France, people. That will see, give rise to the Popular Front in France. The threat of a fascist takeover prompted the creation of the coalition of Republicans, Socialists, Communists, and Radicals in the French government. Sounds crazy, but basically centrists and left-wingers will um, basically unite to try to stop a right-wing takeover 
in France. That's what the Popular Front is. It's a centrist and left-wing um, united coalition to try to fight against a right-wing takeover. It was led by Leon Blum. The French New Deal was issued. It was inspired by the U.S. New Deal. He encouraged a union movement and launched far-reaching programs of social reforms throughout France, complete with paid vacations and a 40-hour work week. It failed, however, due to high inflation, they couldn't afford to pay for it, and agitation from the fascists and frightened conservatives in the Senate of France. French divisions over what actions should take place during the Spanish Civil War, which we'll talk about in a later lecture, will ultimately cause the Popular Front in 1936 to fall apart. France remained politically divided as Germany continued its rearmament by the late 1930s after the Nazis had gained control of the government there. Again, we'll talk more specifically about that in the next lecture.